شهد الله أنه لا إله إلا هو والملائكة والملائكة وأولو العلم قائما بالقسط لا إله إلا هو العزيز الحكيم طيب إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئة أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد So alhamdulillah after finishing the first two books خلاصة تعظيم العلم The Etiquette of the Student of Knowledge and الأصول الثلاثة وأصول الثلاثة وثلاثة أصول The Three Fundamentals or Three Fundamental Principles by Sheikh Muhammad Al-Abd Al-Wahab Rahmatullahi Alayhi We're now moving on to the next book inshallah which is called شروط الصلاة وكانه واجباتها The conditions of the salah is wajibat The AC is on The Um and the conditions of the salah, the pillars of the salah, and the wajibat or its requirements. Taib. The book, as you know, is on the topic of fiqh. The last book that we studied was on the topic of aqidah. And if you remember, when we were studying, or when we started Usul al Thalatha, on the first lesson we had a muqaddimah, an introduction into aqidah, its importance, its virtues. And where it is traced back to Today we're going to have the same introduction inshallah The book that we're going to study Talks about exactly what it says on the title Conditions Conditions are things that are done before the salah You all know about them Or you, you've all memorized them For example, wudu Facing the qibla <coughs> Satir al-awra Covering of the awra Purification all of these conditions you already know of. Then there are pillars of the salah. Pillars are things that are done within within the salah, inside the salah. For example, saying Allahu Akbar, takbirat al-haram, the very first takbir. Then reading the Fatiha, going down for a court, going down for sujood, getting up, and so on. These are pillars. The next thing that the Sheikh talks about is wajibat, things that are obligatory in the salah, <coughs> things that are must, a must in the class, in the salah. And he'll mention, or we'll mention the differences between these three terminologies: conditions, wajibat, things that are wajib, and pillars, things that are arkan, pillars in the salah. We're going to talk about the differences. From the other things that, or from the things that we're going to study in the book, inshallah, is sujood sahwi or bits of sujood sahwi And these sujood and yani sujood sahwi when to perform sujood sahwi the reason, uh, the three reasons why a person may perform sujood sahwi However, before all of that, <coughs> I felt it's important for us to look at the bigger picture when it comes to fiqh. Since we're studying the science today, Let's see where it is derived from, where it comes from. So we're going to talk about something which is called al mabadi al ashara the three, the ten mabadi or the ten things that should be learnt before studying a new subject. Then we're going to talk about the progression of fiqh or the stages of fiqh rather, the stages of fiqh within Islam within the Islamic history. From the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam up until our era. Then we're going to talk about madhahib. What is a madhab? And we're going to talk about the four madhabs briefly, briefly. I won't dwell, uh, go deep into it because hopefully, inshallah, somewhere along the line, uh, I hope to go through it in a lecture, separate lecture on madhabs. Then we're going to talk about, last but not least, things or asbab ikhtilaf al ulama. Reasons why scholars may differ. Fiqh is slightly different to aqidah in the or very different to aqidah in the sense that when we were in aqidah or when we were studying usul al thalatha, you did not used to hear the 
the scholars differ on this topic, the scholars differ on this mas'ala. The ikhtilaf in aqeedah is between Ahlul Sunnah and Ahlul Bid'ah. طيب. But with fiqh, the khilaf between the scholars is a khilaf, a differing between Ahlul Sunnah, Ahlul Sunnah within themselves. <coughs> so we're going to mention about, about eight or nine reasons why the scholars may differ. So that the student doesn't think, well, yeah, why does this, why does Imam Ahmed or why did Imam Abu Hanifa reject this hadith? You will learn that they did not reject the hadith and that's not possible for the imams to reject the hadith. It's impossible for them to reject the hadith. Like in there are reasons why they did not implement that hadith and we shall see them bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Again, it requires that you write, that you write and if you miss things or some things, then you can go through the recording. You can go through the recording. The and it's important that you take notes. As I keep stressing, the difference between this sort of class and a lecture is that a lecture you just sit down and listen to whatever the teacher or the person giving the lecture says. You can fall asleep, you can stay awake, you can do whatever you want. And then by the time you leave the lecture, maybe your iman's increased, but you leave the lecture with nothing more than your iman increasing. And if the person talks about something new, then you'll learn that new thing as well. Like in the difference between lessons is that lessons are not just Iman boosters. Yes, they are Iman boosters, but they are things or they are sessions that you actually learn your religion. So if you come into class and you don't learn something practical on that day, then that means the teacher has failed in his target of teaching the students. طيب. The very first point we're going to study is al al Ashara lil Fiqh al Islami. The ten points, ten things we should know as an introduction for al Fiqh. <coughs> and for those of you that don't know, there are lines of poetry that these are mentioned in. Who knows these? In the Mabadi al Fun in Ashara. الحد والموضوع ثم ثمرة والاسم واسم الاستمداد ونسبة وفضله وحكم شارع والواضع والاسم الاستمداد وحكم شارع والبعد بالبعد اكتفى طيب the definition تعريف الفقه what is the definition of فقه linguistically Meaning in the Arabic language. Why? Because the Sharia was revealed in the Arabic language. In the Arabic language, al-fiqh, al-fiqh means al-fahm, understanding. Al-fiqh means understanding. As long as you understand something, you say faqih to shay. I understood the thing that was being taught. And it is used a lot in the Quran. They said, "Qalu ya Shu'aybu ma nafqahu kathira min ma taqul ma nafqahu." Ya Shu'aybu, we don't understand much of what you're saying. All of this is new to us. And Musa alayhi salam said, "Wahlu al-qudat min lisani yafqahu qawli." Musa alayhi salam made dua. Rabb shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri. Wahlu al-qudat min lisani. يَفْقَهُمْ قَوْلِهِ He made dua to Allah Jalla wa'ala that Fir'aun and his people understand what he was saying. يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِهِ أَيْ لِيَفْقَهُ قَوْلِهِ طيب, That's the first definition. In the Sharia lakin, not in the terminology of the scholars, not istilahan. In the Sharia, al-fiqh is to understand the whole Sharia and to act upon it. To understand the whole Sharia. Fahmu al-Deen wal amalu bih. To understand the religion and to act according to it. 
that's why the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Man yuridillahu bihi khayran, yufaqihu fi din." Whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa taala wants good for, He gives him what understanding of the religion. When did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say this? When he was alive, sah. When the Prophet was alive, was fiqh known just to be the five pillars of Islam or hajj, siyam, fasting, salah, zakah? No. Fiqh, during the time of the Prophet wasallam, and any time it's mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah, includes the whole sharia. Whether it's issues of aqidah, whether it's hadith, tafsir, uh, and fiqh as we know it now. As we know it now. Taib, how many definitions have we gone through? Two. Two. The first one being? Lughatan, linguistically. In the Arabic language, what does it mean? Al Faham, understanding. The second? Shara'an. What is the meaning of fiqh? Shara'an? To understand and act upon the religion of Allah Jalla wa Ala. Taib. As for istilah, and, and this is where we come in now, alhamdulillah. This is important because this is where we come in and this is what we're studying. The definition according to the scholars of fiqh, the scholars that uh, specialize in fiqh, for example, the four madhabs and so on, they have their own definition of what fiqh is. They say it is ma'rifatul ahkami, ma'rifatul ahkami, knowing the ahkam, معرفة الأحكام الشرعية معرفة الأحكام الشرعية العملية المكتسبة من الأدلة التفصيلية معرفة الأحكام الشرعية العملية المكتسبة من أدلة من الأدلة التفصيلية and that means معرفة الأحكام knowing the أحكام knowing the rulings معرفة الأحكام الشرعية knowing the rulings of the شريعة how to pray how to pay زكاة how to fast and how to perform حج العملية Al-amaliyya meaning pertaining to the actions of the Muslim. What does that take out and what does it exclude? Rulings of aqidah. So whatever we were studying in usul in fiqh, uh, afwan, in usul al-thalatha in the last 10 lessons, that's not fiqh according to the fuqaha. <coughs> Tayyip. Al-Amaliyya Al-Muqtasaba That is derived from The Adilla Tafsiliya That is derived from the Quran And the Sunnah Like in specific verses For example When you're talking about The obligation of Salah Wa aqimu salah Establish the prayer Allah says When we're talking about Fasting We don't say it is wajib in the Quran In general لا. Mentioning the evidence Kutiba alaykum siyam that is the specific evidence. Tayyip. Is that understood? The definition of fiqh is the rulings of the sharia that are pertaining to our actions. That are pertaining to our actions such as the salah, hajj, zakah, fasting, jihad, al amr and so on. Lakin, those rulings are also derived from al-adilla tafsila. They are derived from the Quran and the sunnah. Al-Mawdu'ah The third thing is Al-Mawdu'ah What is the topic of this? Fi'lu al-Mukallafi Min haythu ma Yathbutu lahu min al-Ahkam al-Shari'iyya Best the actions of the Mukallaf The actions, the ibadat that we're meant to do That is what it discusses That's what fiqh discusses that's why the book we're studying, what does it discuss? What is it on the topic of? As-salah. And in salah, we're going to talk about 
also tahaga the conditions of the salah wudu how to make wudu what nullifies wudu and so on so that is the topic of fiqh so in this book we're not going to talk about like the interpretation of different ahadith or we're not talking about tafsir the tafsir of the kitab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala interpretation of the Quran of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nor are we going to talk about aqidah i'tiqad so we're not going to talk about what we've been talking about in the last 10 lessons of usul al-thalatha the questions of the grave yawm al-qiyamah al-imanu billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusuli these things are not going to be studied in this book obviously we'll mention them because the sharia is uh, connected like here we're going to be talking about the actions that a person does to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the fourth point is a thamara what is the thamara what is the benefit the benefit is that you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correctly that <coughs> you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correctly I, uh? One, two, one, two, three. Type, now. Third one. According to, uh, now, acting according to the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly, that is the benefit of this knowledge or this science. <coughs> that you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correctly and that you deal with the creation in a correct way. You deal with the people in a correct way. The mu'amala sahiha. Mu'amala hasana, yani good dealings with the people. For example, the rulings of nikah, talaq, buying, selling. These are not specifically ibadat, are they? Like when you're buying and selling, you need to know what transactions are halal and what transactions are haram. Tayyip. So the first is that you're able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly and that you're able to Know the rulings regarding what you're buying, what you're selling, how to deal with the people in a correct way. <coughs> and to attain success in the dunya and in the hereafter. Nisbatuhu ila ghayrihi min al What is the connection between fiqh and other sciences? The connection is that fiqh is a science from all of the other sciences of the sharia. And fiqh cannot stand alone except without these other sciences. For example, we said that fasting is wajib, sah? Fasting is wajib. Where do we derive that ruling from? From the Quran. Also from the, from the Sunnah. So there's a direct connection between Quran, Hadith, <coughs> and fiqh. Also, when we want to understand the principles of fiqh, the usul al-fiqh, we need, or in order to understand fiqh, we also need usul al-fiqh, the foundations of fiqh. So there's also a direct connection there. Tayyib, al-fadlu, the fourth point or the fifth point, it's virtue. <coughs> it's virtue. What are the virtues of fiqh? Who can tell me one of the virtues of fiqh? Taib, Antalla. Taib, whoever Allah wants understanding for, He gives them understanding of the religion. Lakin, we said that that was general fiqh, isn't it? Ahsan, no. just to repeat for the sisters. The brother said, Shaykh Abdullah said, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Whomsoever Allah Jalla wa Ala wants good for, he gives them understanding of the religion. And fiqh, as we know it now, as we've studied, it comes underneath that umbrella, understanding of fiqh. Now, from the virtues is that you're able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correctly and you know whether your action is sahih or not. Not whether it's accepted or not. Because Allah alam if your action is accepted. 
Like you know whether your action is sound or not. Also the hadith, the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. In summary, every virtue for knowledge in the Quran and the Sunnah is a virtue for al-fiqh. Why fiqh? Because fiqh is only what? A science from the sciences of the sharia. It is ilm. So, man salaka bihi tariqa yaltamisu fihi ilm man sahar Allahu bihi tariqa in jannah. This is, this hadith where the Prophet sallallahu said, whomsoever takes a path seeking knowledge, then Allah will make the path of jannah easy, to, easy for him. This applies to this science because this fiqh is a path to Jannah. Understanding this is a path to Jannah. Knowing how to pray is a path to Jannah. So every single one of you, when you left your homes or wherever it is that you came from, on your way to the lesson, then you are on a path to Jannah, inshallah. Whether you came from home, work, uni, wherever it was. You left your destined, your location and you came to this masjid. That is a path that you've taken for seeking knowledge. And bi'idhnillah, that path leads to Jannah. Al Wadi'u, who is the one that laid down this village, this fiqh? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Allah says, Wa makhalaqtul jinna wal insa illa liya'budun. Allah says that He has not created the jinn and the insa except that they worship Him. And fiqh is that worship. Fiqh is that worship. Tayyib. That's with regards to the initial stage of fiqh however it can be said with regards to the development and the progression the progression of fiqh then it can be said that the fuqaha from or those that the, the, the fuqaha from the sahaba the tabi'un and those that came after them and the imams of the four madhabs and other than them they had a role to play in bringing fiqh to us in how it is now in bringing fiqh to us as we know it now Al-Ism, what is the name of this science? Number one, Al-Fiqh. <coughs> it's called Fiqh. It is called Ilm al Science of the Furu' the branches of the Sharia. So the Sharia has foundations, which, has, which is Aqeedah, and it has Furu' which are the branches of the Sharia. Also, it could be said, Sharia is also one of the names. Sharia. That's why in the universities in Muslim countries, they have, or every university has kulliya to sharia, the kulliya of sharia. In it, they study or they specialize in fiqh and usul al fiqh. So you have kulliya to sharia, and you have kulliya to hadith, and you have kulliya to usul al din, and so on, and kulliya to al al arabiya. So sharia here means that the person is going to be studying. Well, mostly studying fiqh and usul al-fiqh. Al-istimdad, where is it derived from? Where is fiqh derived from? Min al-kitab wa sunnah wa al-ijma' wa al-qiyas. It is derived from kitab and sunnah and the ijma' the consensus of the scholars. And Qiyas, which is analogy. Which is analogy. Hukm Shari'. What is the ruling of learning this fiqh? What is the ruling? Wajib. Hmm? Say that again. It's fogged upon everyone to know the basics. Okay. No, no. Uh, and the rest? No. <laughs> In with regards to the ruling, there's some things that are fagdu ain, meaning fagd upon every single individual, obligatory upon every single Muslim. Then there are things that are 
fardu kifaya that are wajib amongst the Muslims upon the Muslims as a whole a common wajib so for example as salah pray tawheed or leave tawheed salah salah fasting zakah these are wajibat things that are wajib upon every single Muslim and they must do like in there are some things that are in fiqh, studied in the books of fiqh, that are not fagdu'ayn. For example, inheritance. It is not fagdu'ayn upon everybody. And qada, judging. It is not wajib upon everybody. That is called fagdu kifaya. That is called fagdu kifaya. Tayyib. Masailuhu. What are the masail that are studied in this topic? In this science? What are the masail? Nah. There are the scholars divide uh, the masail of fiqh into four, or the abwab or the chapters of fiqh into four. What are they? Al ibadat, worship. So in rubul ibadat, in the court of ibadat, worship, they talk about fasting, salah, prayer, zakah, hajj. Tayyip. The next, muamalat, dealings. Dealings, they talk about buying, selling, renting, loans, and so on. So that is from the Masail that we're going to, or that are studied in fiqh. Thirdly, al-nikah, talaq, marrying, divorce, all of these are studied in fiqh as well. And fourthly, hmm? jinayat, capital punishments, judge. Judging, qada, shahada, witnesses, and all of that is also talked about in the books of fiqh. <coughs> so that is the uh, that is the ten things that are wajib, or afwan, or the ten things that we should know before studying any science. Is that understood? <coughs> the next point that we're going to study is atwarul fiqh al-Islami, the stages of Islamic fiqh, the different stages of Islamic fiqh. And we're going to divide it into six different stages. We're going to divide it into six different stages. And these six different stages, or there are scholars that divide it into four, there are scholars that divide it into five, and so on. Uh, so whether you divide it into five, or four, or six, the ma'luma, the information is exactly the same. It's just different categorization. And they say, la mushahata fil istilah. Tayyib. Ad-Dawul Awwal, the very first stage of fiqh, is al-fiqhu fil asri nabawi Fiqh, during the time of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What was fiqh like during the time of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And that started from, or this first period, Started from the sending of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam became a messenger. طيب. and it ended when the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam died in the eleventh year of Hijrah. sallallahu alaihi wasallam, And this is the most important stage from the stages that we're going to study when it comes to the fiqh of Islam. Why? Because that's when the sharia of Islam started. Oh, that's when the fiqh that we're studying, <coughs> that's when it started. That's when the revelation was coming down upon the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this stage of the sharia or legislation is divided into two stages. Al-Ahd al-Makki, or Al-Ahd al-Makki, Al-Ahd al-Makki, the Ahd of the Makki era, when the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam resided in Mecca, and Al-Ahd al-Madani, when the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated to Medina, when the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated to Medina. So when the, when, or the, the timing for the t uh, stages of Makkah, or the stage of Makkah, is when the Messenger وسلم, became a prophet, up until just before Hijrah, which is 13 years. 13 years. 
And the legislation during that period was mainly focused on usul al-deen, on aqidah, on rectifying the aqidah of the Muslims, on taking them out from shirk and kufr into al-Islam and iman, taking them out from darkness into the light of Islam. So a lot of the revelation that came down and a lot of the legislation was mainly focused on strengthening their iman and making sure that they stayed away from teachings of jahiliyyah, teachings of free Islam. For example, burying their daughters, killing one another, oppressing one another. These are all things, and the fawahish, these are things that Islam started off with by rectifying the state of the people. And it carried on like that to the extent that the salah that we pray five times a day, the scholars say that it was made wajib in the 10th year. In the 10th year of the prophethood of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So in this period, it was solely concentrated on or mainly concentrated on rectifying the aqeed of the people, making sure they don't go back into the old ways of shirk and kufr, making sure that they are firm upon the religion of Islam and the teachings of Islam, that they enjoy the good amongst one another and deal with one another in kindness and so on. Then in the stage of the Madani Ahd, when the Messenger وسلم, migrated <coughs> to Medina, that period was 10 years. From the time the Messenger وسلم, migrated to Medina up until he passed away وسلم. And this was totally different. This period was totally different because now there was a Muslim dawla. There was a government or a khilafa, a Muslim khilafa. So the revelation was related to and dealt with the challenges of having a dawla or having a khilafa or having a government. So it also was uh, uh, also discussed or the revelation was a lot about Zakah, fasting, hajj, jihad, enjoying the good and forbidding the evil, the dealings of the Muslims with the non-Muslims, the dealings of the Muslims of Medina with those that were non-Muslims that were living in Medina. For example, the, the Jews who lived in Medina, who the Messenger وسلم, lived beside. And the Messenger وسلم, signed like a, a, a covenant between them and the Jews that they would live in harmony and that they would protect the city together and so on until they obviously fell into treason. Also the ahkam of nikah, the ahkam of talaq, all of these ahkam were established. Also the capital punishment, the cutting off of the hand, the stoning and so on. Now this wasn't possible in Mecca. Why? Because the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions were getting oppressed. They could barely meet their needs, let alone establish relations or establish relations that uh, or rulings that were established by the Sharia of Islam in terms of governing. So the governing law wasn't in place in Mecca. Because in Medina, in Mecca, they did not have a government. They were living amongst Quraysh who were harming them. طيب, what were the sources of reference and the sources of legislation during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Huh? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what else? The Quran. What else? Huh? The, the, so the Quran and the Sunnah. What else? The Sahaba? Hmm? No. Sources of legislation. So we said the Quran and the Sunnah, and some of the Prophet said the Sahaba as well. Ijma' Ijma' and Qiyas. Taib. Quran, Sunnah, yes. Quran and the Sunnah were the legislation. As for Ijma', what is Ijma'? Huh? The consensus of the scholars. Fi asrin min al usuri ba'da wafati nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So there, is, there was no Ijma' the, 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 
the point of ijma did not exist during the time of the Prophet sallallahu so it would not be said Abu Bakr Uthman Ali Abu, uh, Umar and Ali have ijma on this masala la because it would be taken back to the Quran and the Sunnah that was the only form of legislation and if ijma wasn't in place then obviously qiyas also wasn't in place because there was no need there was no need if they had a masala if they had the question they would go to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he would rule according to the Quran and the Sunnah. Taib. So the sources of legislation during the time of the Prophet were what? The Quran and the Sunnah. هذا العصر. What were the pros of this or the, the benefits or the special characteristics of this time or this stage in the stage of Al-Fiqh al-Islami? Excellent. The Wahi was coming down. Being able to go to Naam. So we'll list them down, five or six. The first one, Wujud al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa The presence of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was amongst them. And that is a ni'mah, that is a blessing. If they had any issues, they would go back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Secondly, Nuzul al-Wahi fi hadha al-Asr. The revelation was coming down. The sending down of the revelation. So sometimes the revelation would come down for a specific reason. For a specific reason. For example, something would happen and then the revelation would come down affirming or negating or teaching the Muslims what to do in that situation. For example, Qisatul Ifq, when they accused Aisha radiallahu anha, when the Munafiqun, Tayyip, Quran came and proved her innocence, right? So there was an incident and the Qur'an was revealed. Also, قَدْ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّتِي تُجَادِلُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا وَتَشْتَكِي إِلَى اللَّهِ The woman that was debating with her husband, that was arguing with her husband over the dhihar, this, this verse was revealed. Then at times, the Qur'an was also revealed without any specific situation or scenario happening, without any event taking place. So the Qur'an would come down, يعني, normally. And we'll study that in Usul Tafsir, inshallah. Also, <coughs> the thirdly, <coughs> the points of leg- or the sources of legislation were specific to the what? The Quran and the Sunnah. The Quran and the Sunnah during this period and during this time. And that, now you've lessened the room for, or room for movement and room for legislation. So the Quran is clear and the Sunnah is clear of the Message Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like when you start talking about things like Qawlu Sahabi is the statement of a Sahabi then that is vast. Because now you need to talk about what type of statement of the Sahabi and so on. Number four, Atadaruj of the Sharia. The Sharia when it came down, it came down in stages. It came down in stages. And this is extremely important because we know that, <coughs> for example, al khamar alcohol, wasn't made haram immediately. Allah mentioned that it was from the khaba'ith. Then Allah told them to stay away from it when they come into salah. And then Allah called it rids. So it was made haram in different stages. And the wisdom behind that is, it is easier for people to accept and adopt the Sharia, once it is sent down in stages. Taib. For example, when the Prophet wasallam was made a messenger, alcohol was considered the norm. Taib. Khamar was considered the norm. Because it was considered the norm, there were things that were more important than the drinking of alcohol. For example, in Mecca, people were worshipping idols. And that is worse than what? Then they uh, then being intoxicated. People were slaughtering for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People were killing their daughters and so on. So there were things that were more important than alcohol at that particular moment. So because of the beauty of the Sharia, it came down in stages. Can we say that today? Can we apply that today? Meaning, for example, someone says, I'm going to drink alcohol. We say, Taib, do you pray? No. Taib, carry on drinking alcohol. Like, try praying and initially pray two, three times a day. And then, inshallah, five, six months down the line, when you're used to it, start praying four times a day. And then, inshallah, somewhere along the line, you pray five times a day. Can we, 
Can we do that? No, we can't do that. Why? Because now the Sharia has been completed. What you can do is when you're, tar- when you're giving tarbiyah, when you're teaching people, and when you're calling people to Islam, and when you're keep teaching Muslims within Islam, then you can teach them in stages. For example, you don't teach them a difficult book when they haven't understood the easier books. طيب. Lacking to say that the Sharia itself, because it was revealed in stages back then, now it's in stages as well. Lab. It is not permissible. The fifth point, Khamisan, the ahkam in this time, during this time of the Prophet وسلم, were things that would actually take place. So something would take place and then they would go to the Messenger. Something would take place. For example, the Prophet, the companions, in one of the hadith, the companions were on a journey on their way to Medina. <coughs> they were on their way to Medina and then they could not find where the Qibla was or they didn't know where the Qibla was. So every one of them done ijtihad. The way he thought the Qibla was, he faced that way. And then in the morning when they woke up, they found that they all faced the wrong way. They came back to the Prophet ﷺ. And they asked the Prophet. However, that was something that happened, right? It was waqi'iyan, yani it was something that happened. So they would ask the Prophet وسلم, after it happened. They wouldn't say, Ya yani, Ya Rasulullah, if this happens, this happens. If this was to happen, what should we do? Like it was, they would ask the Prophet things after they happened. Also, number six, the Prophet وسلم, allocated certain, of, certain companions. Or chose certain companions to write the revelation, the wahi, kataba, kataba tul wahi. For example, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Zayd ibn Thabit, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, Ubay ibn Ka'ab. About these six or seven companions. They would write the revelation for the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the legislation carried on in that pattern until the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed away. Taib, the next stage is the stage of or fiqh fi asr sahaba Fiqh during the time of the Sahaba. And this started from the death of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam up until the 40th year. After the Khilafah of Ali, when Ali passed away, radiallahu anhu, and the hukum was meant to be given to Al-Hassan ibn Ali radiallahu anhu and he forfeited his right to the Khilafah and he gave it to Muawiyah radiallahu anhu that year was called Amul Jama'a so the state, the beginning or the Asr of the Sahaba the stage of the Sahaba was from the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa up until roughly about the year of 40 when Ali radiallahu anhu passed away so it was the time of the Khulafa Rashidun Abu Bakr his era, Umar's era, Uthman's era, and Ali radiallahu anhu. Why did we say this was, يعني, although there were Sahaba that lived after Ali, right? So why did we say that this was the period of the Sahaba? Fiqh in the time of the Sahaba? There was only the Sahaba at the time. No, there were Tabi'un as well at the time. But that's not the question. The question is, why did we not say even after the year 40, even during the time of Muawiyah and the other companions, they were there, right? Yani they died after Ali, right? Al-Hassan, al Hussein, Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abdullah ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Zubayr, Muawiyah ibn Sufyan. They existed after the death of Ali. Why did we restrict the time of the Sahaba to the 40th year? لا لا nothing to do with age because Abdullah ibn Abbas as well was young لا not not is because it was the time of the Sahaba or the four yeah come come ah صح لكن why did we specify the time of the Sahaba to the year forty from the death of the Prophet to the year forty year forty Yeah. Nah, roughly. Basically, gonna. No. 
there, nothing was legislated in that time. The legislated ended legislation ended with the death of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right. Have you understood the question first? Understanding the question is more important, or is just as important as answering the question. So the question was. During the time that I said the second stage was the stage of the Sahaba Fiqh during the t- time of the Sahaba And it, it started from when? The death of the Messenger of And it ended when? The death of Ali Were there no Sahaba after the death of Ali? There were Why did we specify it to the year 40? Because even though there were Sahaba after the year 40 Like in they were few in number And they had less of an influence into how things were governed that's why this is called Al Fiqh Fi Asri Sahaba. Like in during the time of the Khulafa Rashidun, there was no other person that was going to be, no Tabi'i would be asked to uh, give fatawa and so on. In most cases, in most cases. And the Tabi'un and the Sahaba, who was more during the time of the Sahaba? The Sahaba were more. طيب. So from that time, the Sahaba, with one Allah Ta'ala, alayhim, obviously. They faced challenges different to the challenges they faced with the Messenger Sallallahu time. Why? Because there were so many futuhat. Islam went far and beyond. Islam went far and beyond. A lot of people accepted Islam. A lot of land was the, the, the conquest of Umar radiallahu anhu, the opening of Bayt al-Maqdis, Sham, and so on and so forth. So new civilizations came into al-Islam. And the Sahaba... They carried on giving fatawa and ishtihadat and with the legislation exactly how it was during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, they needed to also derive rulings because of the new things that would happen, the new events that would take place. So they would derive rulings from where? From the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they were able to do so. Rather, they were the best of the people to do so. Why? Because they ri- witnessed the revelation of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The revelation coming down upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And they understood the context that the verses of the Quran were revealed. Just like they understood the context that the ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam were revealed. So they would know what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would say more often than not. And if I give you an example, a person that you've been friends for, for 10 years, مثلاً, he's befriended you and you've been with him for 10 years. You've done a lot of things together. طيب, you've always socialized, you've gone to lessons, you've gone to messages, you've traveled together and so on. That person will know you well. صح? That person knows what you like and what you dislike. طيب. Compare that to a person that you met three weeks ago. <coughs> you haven't socialized much You don't know anything about him طيب. If someone was to say If someone was to ask Does this person For example Abdullah Does Abdullah like مثلا, I don't know What's Abdullah's favorite subject In the science of Islam For example Does he like Aqidah, Fiqh, Hadith and Tafsir and so on Or, or does he specialize in Fiqh and so on طيب. Who's going to know? If I was to ask the person that has been with you for 10 years, will he know or will he not know? He will know, sah? How? He spent time with you. He's revised with you. He's gone to lessons with you. He's heard you talk about the subjects you like. That's exactly how the companions were. They were with the Prophet Sallallahu They traveled with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They went to jihad with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They'd done dealings with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For example, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu was asked about a widow whose husband passed away and he did not allocate and he did not give her or, may, or he did not name the mahr, the sadaq that he was going to give her. So he did not name the mahr and he passed away radiallahu anhu. <coughs> that individual passed away. So they came to Abdullah bin Mas'ud and they asked him what should they do? Does she, is there idda? Is there waiting period, waiting time? Uh, does she get her mihr, her sadaq? So he didn't know that there was a hadith. He didn't know of a hadith and he didn't know of a verse. 
لكن after looking the Quran and Sunnah he couldn't find anything what did he do he made ijtihad and his ijtihad was what that there's idda upon her she has to <coughs> have a waiting period of four months and ten days and for the mahr the sadaq the dowry that wasn't mentioned he says she gets mahr mithl mahr al mithl yani mahr which is uh, considered the norm in in her community طيب whilst he said that or whilst he gave that just after he gave that fatwa another companion came when that companion came he said verily i heard the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam give the same hukum to a female relative of ours exactly the same hukum he said exactly the same or the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam made exactly the same hukum as the one that abdullah ibn mas'ud gave what do we understand from there Hmm? They had the same ijtihad Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, He was so happy when he found that out That he said radiallahu anhu, I have not been this happy since I entered Islam Because it is not something easy When your ijtihad is the same as the ijtihad of The Sahaba or The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Rather if you give a fatwa Or if you give an answer And you find that one of the scholars said the same thing as you You think you're Shaykh al-Islam hmm? Let alone the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like in the Mahal al-Shahid is, why was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud able to give that ijtihad? <coughs> because he lived with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He existed during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he knew what the Prophet would say. طيب, the next point is, inayatul sahaba, inayatul sahaba to be the Qur'an. The importance that the sahaba gave to the Qur'an of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This Qur'an was preserved in that نحن زلنا ذكر وإنا له لحافظون Allah Jalla wa Ala says that the Qur'an is preserved طيب And Allah Jalla wa Ala will preserve the Qur'an of Allah Jalla wa Ala The companions with one Allah Ta'ala alayhim during the time of Uthma, during the time of Abu Bakr there was they went out for jihad and there was a lot of apostates حروب uh, uh, there was a lot of apostates that left the religion of the Prophet وسلم, after the death of the Prophet وسلم. like what happened was the companions went to jihad and many of the Qur'an those that memorized the kitab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, prolif- that were prolific in the memorizing of the Qur'an and the recitation of the Qur'an many of them were killed over about 70 may Allah be pleased with them they were killed then Umar radiallahu anhu noticed this and he feared that people would forget the Quran so he went to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and he said we need to combine all of the Quran that we have because the Quran beforehand during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what was the last point that we mentioned in the last stage there were those that used to write the revelation some of them would write it on trees some of them on, on wood on branches on leaves and so on طيب. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he said to Abu Bakr, let's combine them, combine all of the different parts of the Qur'an. And let's put the Qur'an in one place. And they, Umar agree, Abu Bakr agreed with him, and they uh, chose Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu, who was from the Shabab and the Fuqaha, the scholars, as we shall see, of the Sahaba. They chose him. طيب. So they gathered, there was jam of the Qur'an, there was com- uh, combining of the Qur'an, Completion of the Quran during the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, and it was put in one mushaf, طيب. and that mushaf stayed of stayed of Umar, and then after the death of Umar, stayed of Hafsa. Lacking during the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu, the people started to read in the seven different recitations that they learned from the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, to the extent that the Muslims would be in jihad and what one would read in a recitation. And he would probably read from a mushaf that was different to the mushaf that another sahabi had or another person had. Then Hudayf ibn Yaman radiallahu anhu who was in Azerbaijan at the time, he came to the Prophet sallallahu he came to Uthman radiallahu anhu who was the khilafah at the time. He spent six months to get to Uthman radiallahu anhu and he said to him, Adrik al-Ummah, yani, help the Ummah, help the Ummah, save the Ummah from destruction and differing. And then Uthman radiallahu anhu gathered and several of the companions and he commanded them to write the Quran in one mushaf 
and to use the la- the language of or the recitation of Quraysh. طيب. And that is what is known as, as Al-Mus'haf al- Al-Uthmani. طيب. So the Sahaba, Allah Ta'ala, alayhim, they gave this importance to preserving the Kitab of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. With regards to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, likewise, they did the same thing. When a person would come to them and narrate a hadith, they would say to him, who, have you got someone else as a witness to say what you've just said? To bear witness that the Prophet said this hadith. And I'll give you two examples. The first is with Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Someone came to him during, a, a grandmother came to him, a woman came to him during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And she asked him about inheritance. Does the jadda, does the grandmother get any inheritance? Now as you know in Surah Al-Nisa, all of the verses dealing with Al-Mirat have been mentioned. Has the grandmother been mentioned in that? No, the grandmother hasn't been mentioned in the Quran. طيب. So the Prophet sallallahu or, uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he didn't know of a hadith and obviously he knew it wasn't in the Quran. So he said, wait for me, let me ask the people. Because I don't find in the Quran anything for you. Then he asked the companions. And then Muqayyim bin Shu'bah radiallahu anhu, he said, verily I saw that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave her a sudus, a sixth of the mirath, of the inheritance, a sudus. So he said to him, have you got anyone else to back that up? Not that Muqayyim is a liar. Lakin that is tathabbut. He wanted to affirm and confirm that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said that he gave her this sudus or six. Then another companion, Muhammad Maslama, came and he said, Verily, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa give her a sudus or six. Then he gave it to her. The second incident was with Uthman radial, uh, Umar radiallahu anhu. The second incident was with Umar radiallahu anhu. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he done the same thing. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari came to him and he knocked on his door. Umar was busy. He knocked again. Umar was busy. He knocked again. On the third go, when Umar didn't answer, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari went back. And then Umar came back, came out. And he said to him, where are you going? Said, Why didn't you wait for me? I was busy. And he said, inna mistidhanu thalath. Verily, seeking permission is only three times. Is only sought three times. And then he said, where did you hear that from? It was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said, verily, if you don't get someone else to back your statement up, I'm going to teach you a lesson. Then Abu Musa al-Ash'ari being worried, he went to some of the companions and he found the Ansar sitting down, the helpers, the ones that we've resided in Medina beforehand. He found them sitting down and he said to them, listen, this is what's happening, you know, and Umar, I need someone to back me up. And that hadith was common amongst them. It was known. It was well known amongst them. So they just sent Abu Sa'id al Khudri, who was the youngest person sitting. For example, now we're sitting. Imagine if there's a five year old or six year old sitting as well. And we, someone, يعني, a person comes, an adult comes in, asks us something, and we send the youngest one with, um, amongst us. It means that that is common knowledge, يعني, even he knows. So then he went back to, he went with Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, he went with Abu Musa al-Ash'i radiallahu anhu, and he affirmed what he said to Umar radiallahu anhu. That shows that the companions of Ridwan Allah ta'ala alayhim during that time, they did not want everyone to just start saying anything about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. <coughs> also, even the writing of the a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the companions used to restrict it. Why? Because they feared that people would mistake in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the Quran of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he would, they would prevent them from doing so. And only in the later stages would they recite the hadith a lot, narrate a hadith, and, and it was only written after that. Tayyip. Masadi wa tashri' fi ahdi sahaba. What were the sources of legislation during the time of the sahaba? First and foremost, the Quran and the Sunnah, obviously. The Quran and the Sunnah always remain. Secondly, Al Ijtihad and Al Ijma. Al Ijma and Ijtihad. Ijma is the consensus of scholars of a certain era upon and their agreement upon a certain mas'ala. They agree on a certain mas'ala. 
So for example, the Sahaba, there was ijma' that they would combine the hadith of the, 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 the Quran of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one mushaf. Ijma'. Also, when Abu Bakr said he's going to fight those that apostated after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi all of the companions agreed with him. That was what? Ijma'. The fact that the, 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 the Jeddah, that she gets inheritance of a sudus, Ijma'. Yes, there's a hadith, but there was also an Ijma'. From the Sahaba, Ridwanullah Ta'ala alayhim. Tayyib. So that is Ijma'. Ijma' wasn't possible during the time of what? During the time of the Prophet Sallallahu because it was only the Quran and the Sunnah. Also, the Ijma' of the companions is the strongest of Ijma'at. The strongest consensus or Ijma' is the Ijma' of the companions, Ridwanullah Ta'ala alayhim. Also, another source or reference point appeared not legislation ijma' is not legislation ijma' is a reference point another reference point appeared which was ijtihad Ij, eh? ijtihad and ijtihad is when a alim he looks and he gives all of his effort into finding the ruling of a certain issue from the Quran and the Sunnah the alim does his best to find and to derive a ruling from the Quran and the Sunnah. And that is found, or the, the foundations for that is in the Sharia. The Prophet وسلم, said, If the Hakim, the judge, if he gives ijtihad, makes ijtihad, he puts all of his effort into finding a ruling, and he does so, then he is rewarded with two rewards. The reward of the effort that he put in and the reward of the fatwa being correct or the ruling being correct. And if he and if he makes a mistake in his ruling, he gets one reward. And that reward is for what? Ijtihad, the effort that he put in. Like in that ijtihad cannot be from any Tom Smith and Harry, sah? It needs to be from who? From the fuqaha, the ulama, someone who is a alim. Like in someone like us can't say I made ijtihad and this is what I think it is. No. That person has to be a person who is a alim in the sharia of al-Islam. طيب. As for the sahaba, Allah ta'ala alayhim, we can, with regards to narrating the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and giving fatawa and legal rulings, we can put them into three categories. al muktirun those that were plentiful in riwayah, in giving fatawa and narrating a hadith, and those that, and those that were mutawassitun, they were yani, halfway. So they would give a lot of fatawa, like not as many as the muktirun or the first category. And the third are the muqillun, muqillun. Those that would give rarely give fatawa. Rarely give fatawa. So in general, the companions who would give fatawa and have opinions and ijtihad were about 130 plus. About 130. Seven of those would constantly give fatawa. From them, radiallahu anhu, <coughs> as Ibn Qayyim mentions in Alam Waqi'un, Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu anhu. Umar was a faqih. Ali ibn Abi Talib, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Aisha radiyallahu anhuma, Ummul Mu'minin, Zayd ibn Thabit, Zayd ibn Thabit, <coughs> Abdullah ibn Abbas, and Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhu. Tayyib. And in the second category, Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu, Um Salama, Anas bin Malik, Uthman bin Affan, Abu Sa'id al Khudri. (coughs) Abdullah bin Abbas, Abdullah bin Umar. Don't worry too many about the, don't worry too much about the names. Lakin, just know that there were those that used to give for tower, that were plentiful in giving. Fatawa. Then there were those that were 
medium, يعني, they would give a lot of fatawa, like not as many as the th- first set of companions. Then there were those that would give fatawa. And it would be narrated from them. It would be narrated from them. طيب. The special characteristics of this Sahaba or this era, or يعني, the good thing is about the advantages of this, اختصار الصحابة على الشريعة المباركة دون غيرها. The Sahaba would restrict themselves to the Sharia of Islam, the Quran and the Sunnah. And any time they found a ruling in the Quran and the Sunnah, they wouldn't go to anything else. They wouldn't go to their ijtihad. Also, تقديم الشرع على رأي. They would give the Sharia precedence over the aql and the رأي and ijtihad. Reasoning, legal opinion. Their opinions, they would put the Sharia before it, the Quran and the Sunnah. Also, they, also, also, they wouldn't follow anyone that opposed the Quran and the Sunnah, regardless of who it was. Anyone that opposed any verse from the Kitab of Allah in a Mas'ala or the Hadith of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa they would not follow. Also, at Tathabut wa Tarawi fil Ijtihad wa Adam wa bil Futiya, they would be, they wouldn't hasten in giving fatawa. They would ask around, and Umar radiallahu anhu, for example, and the other companions, they would all get together and have shura. And only then would they give a fatwa. Some of them would be asked the question, who would say, go ask him. Some, and he would be asked some, uh, again. That person would go to the next person, he would say, ask him. To the extent that it would, the person would end up going to 10, 20, 30 companions. Why? Because none of them wanted to give a fatwa. Because giving a fatwa is a serious thing. طيب. That's the opposite to us. Nowadays, everyone wants to be asked the question. Everyone wants to be Shaykh al-Islam and have YouTube pages and give fatwa online and so on. Whereas the Sahaba, they would run away from that. Why? Because giving answers or giving fatawa is not something which is light. It is not a light matter. You're talking about the Kitab of Allah, the Sharia of Al-Islam. The, طيب, the third stage, The third stage is fiqh during the time of the Tabi'een. And that started from the, after the death of Ali radiallahu anhu in the 40th year. <coughs> up until the year 132 when the Dawla al-Umawiyyah it ended or the ending of the Dawla al-Umawiyyah so this was the, the time for the Tabi'un those that came after the companions the students of the companions the students of the companions and the students of the companions in most cases carried on exactly how the companions would or how they used to deal with Issues of legislation So they would go back to the Quran of Allah The Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam If they could not find anything in the Quran and the Sunnah They would go to the Ijtihad of the Sahaba Or the Ijma' of the Sahaba If they found anything in the Ijtihad And the Ijma' of the Sahaba The companions They wouldn't make their own opinion They would not make their own opinion Like in during this period A lot of events took place in the history of Al-Islam. For example, the Muslims divided into different groups, whereas previously, during the companion's time, and during obviously the time of the Prophet the Muslims were united. Lakin, there appeared the Shia, the Khawarij also appeared, and the Khawarij themselves had different groups, and they would fight the Muslims and kill them, and so on. Also, the Shia appeared during the time of Ali radiallahu anhu, lakin, they were, uh, they had a lot more power after the death of Ali radiallahu anhu. And then there was Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. Then there was, there was issues of Khilaf on who's going to be the Khalifa of the Muslims. Who's going to be the Khalifa of the Muslims. طيب. Lakin in this era, the time of the Sahaba, people used to narrate the ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Especially the companions. They used to narrate the ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Although during the early stages of the companions, they did not. So that people would not mistaken between the Quran and the Ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Lakin now that that wasn't a possibility, they started to narrate the Ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for fear that they would die with that knowledge, for fear that they would die with that knowledge. Secondly, the Fuqaha or the scholars of the companions they dispersed. Some of them went to Iraq, some of them went to Basra, Kufa, some of them went to Sham, some of them went to Misr, different places. And each companion would teach the people that he lived amongst. طيب. 
لكن اوبسلي it had disadvantages because the ahadith were getting narrated so much لكن there were people who were misguided and deviants and munafiqun who would invent a hadith and say that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it to the extent that if one of them wanted to sell an item a petty item he would make up a hadith talking about this item and said the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said verily whoever buys it is blessed encouraging people to buy it to that extent so al wad or wad'un they became a lot that's why have you heard hadith that is mawdu' hadith that has been ascribed to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam like he did not say it so that also appeared and lakin alhamdulillah there were a lot of ulama <coughs> at that time there were a lot of ulama at that time also during the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the time of the sahaba the answers that they would give would be to questions and things events that have actually taken place right lakin during the time of the tabi'in a new kind of like uh, methodology appeared which was making up scenarios and then finding solutions and that's where it leaned, leaned more towards a ra'yi and opinion so to make ijtihad afun, to make opinions to make scenarios and then to make ijtihad and at that time yeah at that time two madrasas appeared two schools of thoughts appeared <coughs> at the beginning stages ahlul madina and ahlul kufa ahlul madina the people of Medina were considered Ahlul Hadith. And Ahlul Kufa were considered Ahlul Ra'i. Ahlul Ra'i. During this time, there were four of the Sahaba, the Fuqaha of the Sahaba, that were distinguished from everyone else due to their fiqh and their understanding of the Sharia. And they were the younger companions. From them, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. Who is in Kufa? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu who was in Medina Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu who was also in Medina and who also took over the leadership of uh, the Sharia and teaching and so on after Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu and in Mecca Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu in Mecca, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. And each of them had students. Each of these companions had students. Lakin, they would obviously refer back to these four companions. طيب. The fourth stage is fiqh during the time of the a'imma that are mujtahidun. And, due, and the time of writing down the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the fiqh of imams. طيب. And that started in the middle of the fourth, uh, the second Qagn. Yani after about 100 and something towards 200 after the death of the Prophet wasallam, and it stretched over to the fourth century. This was a golden period for Al-Fiqh. It was a stage in which it developed and it flourished and it used to, it was thriving. It was called Al-Asr al-Dhahabi lil-Fiqh or Izdihar al-Fiqh So it wasn't يعني, the way Fiqh was authored was, and also all other sciences Hadith, Tafsir, Nahu There were many books that were written and many sciences that were started during that time For example, Usul al-Fiqh started by who? Imam Shafi'i rahmatullahi alayhi during that time Likewise, Al-Qawa'id al-Fiqhiyya started by the Hanafiya, one of the Imams of the Hanafiya. طيب. So the most important things that took place during that time is Tadween al-Sunnah, the writing of the Sunnah, the preservation of the Sunnah. So all of the books of Sitta, Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Da'ud, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, and all of these books, and what these books were written during that period, during that time. So a lot of the Sunnah was preserved. And there was also other books, Muwatta and Masanid, Musnad, Musnad Ahmed, Muslim Kada, Abi Ya'la and so on. طيب. Also the fatawa of the companions would be combined or were combined or written in one book, Musnad Ibn Mishayba, Musnad Ibn Abdurazaq and so on. Also the madaris came. The madaris came and they were 
يعني they started during that time أهل المدينة أو أهل الحديث أهل رأي عند الظاهرية أبو داود الظاهري these three madrasas appeared in power during that time يعني they were plentiful and there were a lot of it had each one of them had followers also المذاهب الفقهية the four madhabs also appeared during that time the four madhabs also appeared in that time and these four madhabs it wasn't just these four madhabs rather I should say there were madhahib different madhabs and as we shall see a madhab is a way of learning and a way of giving fatawa طيب so now people are only accustomed with how many madhabs four the, lacking there were many madhabs beforehand some considered stronger than the madhabs that we have today for example al awzai Muhammad ibn Abdurrahman al awzai he had a madhab Sufyan al thawri had a madhab Layth ibn Sa'ad al-Misri rahimahumullah he had a madhab Daud ibn Ali al-Asfahani he had a madhab Muhammad ibn Jarir al-Tabari the imam that's got the tafsir tafsir al-Tabari he had an imam he had a, a methodology a madhab Lakin these madhabs they did not exist for long they did not exist they disappeared Straight after the death of the imams Why? Because their students did not Carry on their legacy Like in these four madhabs that we have today Their students Their students carried on the legacy طيب. The four madhab uh, The fifth stage Is fiqh after these After the time of the imams Like the fifth stage The fourth stage was the last one The fifth stage is the fiqh بعد عصر الأئمة المجتهدين fiqh after these great imams meaning after the madhabs Imam Ahmed, Abu da- uh, Imam Ahmed Imam Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi after their time after their time and that stretched from the 4th century up until the 13th century and it's just about 100 something years ago and that period was known as the time that these madhabs were polished and different books were authored in each of these madhahib some muhtasarat some small mutun and then some explanations explanations for those muhtasarat yani those short mutun there would be books that would explain or uh, now interpret these books and there are many books that were written that you're accustomed with now. Zad al Mustaqni, Al Mughni ibn Qudama, Undatul Fiqh ibn Qudama, Al Kafi ibn Qudama, all of none, all of Imam Nawawi's books, and so on. All of these books were written after that period and before the 13th century. And so, naam, we leave that point. Lakin. During that time there appeared blind following and ta'assub or hooliganism to some of these madahib, to the madahib. To the extent that they would discuss, is a Hanafi allowed to pray behind the Shafi'i? To the extent that they would say, is a Hanafi woman allowed to marry a Shafi'i man? A man that is from the Shafi'i methodology. And they would, some of them would physically attack one another. And they would say that anyone upon the Hanafi madhab is upon the haq because the haq is solely in the Hanafi madhab. Or they would say the haq is only in the Shafi'i madhab. Or they would say the haq is only with the Maliki madhab or the Hanbali madhab. So that was one of the cons or disadvantages that appeared during this time. And ijtihad became little during that time. There wasn't much the ijtihad. There was not much ijtihad. The, the, many of the scholars and the imams of each madhab would just restrict themselves to their madhab. And it reached a point that in the haram of Makkah, in the haram of Makkah, there would be four jama'as. Every salah had four jama'ah. The Hanafiyah would pray at a certain time, the Shafi'iyah at a certain time, the Malikiyah at a certain time, and the Hanabila at a certain, at a certain time. Lakim, pay attention. The fact that this blind following took place and the fact that there were people that were 
uh, staunch supporters of their madhab and degrading all the all of the other uh, other madhabs, is that a fault of these imams? La. Does that take away how precious these imams are and how important these madhabs are? La. It doesn't. It doesn't. Just because there are people that misused it and misunderstood it, it doesn't decrease the gratitude that we should have for these great imams and these madhabs. For example, Al Islam now, when you open when you look into social media, what do you find? Islam terrorist. Islam terrorist. So to the extent that if anything happens, they would look at the, the name and the name would tell us if it was a terrorist attack or not. Does that mean that we leave Islam for the bad media or the press or the propaganda? La. So the fact that these things took place during this era, it doesn't mean that we should leave off these um naam, that we should leave off these madahib. And we'll talk about the madahib inshallah probably next week. The last stage is Adawr al The sixth stage, which is the current era, the fourteenth century. How is fiqh in the 14th century? Again, there were pros and cons. Ijabiyat and salbiyat. So these madhabs, alhamdulillah, they existed and there were people that would teach these madhabs and governed by these madhabs. Lakin, that governing became in things that were ahwal al-shakhsiyah just to do with nikah and talaq in many lands. Also, what appeared in this cent- in this era is man-made laws. Al-Qawanin al So in a lot of Muslim countries, they would use, or they wouldn't govern with the Sharia of Islam. They would govern with what? Democracy, secularism, and so on. So they would leave the governing of the Sharia to simple things like talaq and nikah and so on in the mahkamah. And that wasn't known in the past. So during the past, the, the main source of uh, legislation would be the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And the reason why these madhabs spread is because of these qudat being from certain madhabs, as we shall see next week, inshallah. So from the disadvantages or the cons of this era is the qawanin al wat'iyya These qawanin, these man-made laws that have been used to govern Muslim lands. In which the Sharia of Islam was thrown away in many lands. Also, from the disadvantages, is that people initially people would do ta'asub and blind following of these madhabs, right? So that was one extreme. The other extreme happened, whereby people appeared who would degrade these madhabs and say, "Leave these madhabs alone, and we don't need these madhabs." and and it as if these madhabs are a reason for the Muslims to differ. When in reality, these madhabs are not a reason for the differing of the Muslims. If anything, it could be said the opposite. That these madhabs are a reason for the Muslims to come together. So rather than coming under four imams, they would come under millions of imams. Which is better? And these madhabs, as we shall see next week, inshallah, is like a university. Every madhab is a university. And these madhabs, they've been, throughout history, they've been preserved. And the madhab that you hear, مثلا, Imam Abu Hanifa's madhab, is not just the opinions and the ijtihadat of Abu Hanifa. It would be the ijtihadat of all of the other imams and the students that he had. كذلك, the madhab of the Shafi'iyyah is not just what Shafi'i said rahmatullah alayhi Lakin, those that came after him, those imams To the extent that a Ramli and a Nawawi for example in the Shafi'i madhab Would be considered a reference point And there would be scholars that had a lot of virtue over the imam himself For example they say that all of the Shafi'iyyah Or Shafi'i has a virtue of all of the imams of the Shafi'i Except for who? Because he combined all of the books of Shafi'i He combined the fiqh of Imam Shafi'i طيب. Questions after I'm going to finish in about two minutes anyway 
Lakin, there were positives that came out and advantages that came from this era. The very first is Kathratu Tiba'at al Kutub al Fiqhiyya. The books of fiqh were printed in abundance. It was easy to print these books. Why? Because of technology. So in the past, if they had a copy of, for example, Al Mughni, Ibn Qudama, they would just write it, and it would take ages to write them down. To write it يعني, by hand. And previously, before this era, before our time, they, many of the books were manuscripts. Makhtutat. Lakin, al Kutub. And that definitely helps in the spreading of knowledge and the spreading of fiqh more specifically. Like now, مثلا, imagine if we're, we're going to start the book, inshallah, every one of you is easily able to get a copy, sah? Imagine if only five of you had a copy. And then all of you, everyone would have to sit around these five. طيب, المسوعات الفقهية also, encyclopedias in fiqh. And the most popular one is المسوعة الكويتية which consists about 45 volumes of masail, fiqh masail, fiqh issues in alphabetical order. And it's written in a way that is easy to understand. Also, majami' fiqhiyya, the introducing of majami' fiqhiyya. Majami' fiqhiyya is a group of scholars that specialize in fiqh getting together to discuss different issues. Different issues. For example, is it permissible to donate organs? The scholars have talked about it in these majami' fiqhiyya. Every single mutakhassis, every single person that specializes in fiqh, مثلا 50 members or 20 members, they would discuss this masala. But they would do research beforehand. And then at the end of the, 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 the seminar or the end of the, the, the week conference, after hearing all of the different opinions, they would come to a conclusion. طيب. Then there were also... The, there were places to give fatwa, to go and get fatwa, sorry. So for example, Darul Ifta al Misriya, Darul Ifta bil Mamlak al Arabiya Saudiya. There are certain places that the scholars are, you can go to and ask them questions. So you can go to Fozan and his Dawah Mathalan, for example, starts about 7 30, 8 o'clock, up till about Duhr. Any time during that time, you can go and ask them questions. Sheikh Fozan, Sheikh Al Haydan, Rahimahullah, Sheikh Al Khadaig, and all of the other Kibarul Ulama. And the same goes for those hate hayat kibar ulama in other countries. And that wasn't previously there. So if you wanted a fatwa in the past, you would go to the masjid or you try to find the imam or the sheikh. Like now there are places that are specific for fatwa. Also, from the good points or from the advantages of this era is the establishing of kulliyat al-shari'iyah. In Islamic universities, having a whole kulliya of as a kulliya to sharia in which fiqh is studied under a certain madhab or in a certain way, fiqh and usul al fiqh are studied. And there are many Jamia Islamiyah, Jamia al Imam, Al Azhar, many universities, many universities that have a kulliya of the sharia in which fiqh is studied. And la shak, that helps the student of knowledge develop and to become an alim because the muqarrat or the curriculum that is made or that is um, that is laid out for these institutes have been laid out and put down placed by scholars placed by scholars like the muqarrat of Jamia Islamiyah placed by Ibn Baz and the scholars likewise the muqarrat of Jamia Al-Imam in the past would be done by Sheikh Muhammad Ibrahim the mufti before uh, Ibn Baz rahimahullah ta'ala rahmatan wasi'a so on that note, inshallah, we'll finish today's session. Uh, just, just under half an hour left. Next week, inshallah, we'll continue with two points and then we'll start the book. We'll talk briefly about the four madhabs, um, the imam of the madhab and the foundations, the usul of the madhab. And then we'll look at asbab ikhtilaf al-ulama, some of the reasons why scholars may differ. And then we'll start the book, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala.